Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Real Talk. On today's show, it is arguably one of the hardest jobs in the world. But with two billion people fulfilling this role, it is also one of the most popular. Today, I'm joined by our expert panel of mothers and our studio audience to talk about motherhood. Let me start by introducing the panel today. First, we're joined by Nasser Rahman, who is a vice president for the Ladies Auxiliary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community here in the UK, as well as being in charge of the religious and social education of girls aged 7 to 14. She's a teaching assistant by profession, mainly supporting special needs children. Assalamu alaikum. Assalam. Next, Dr. Amtha Reza Carmichael is a consultant specialist breast surgeon here in the UK, and she works closely with a genetics unit in Birmingham. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. We're also joined by Maryam Chaudhry, who is a facilitator for a parenting program in the UK, teaching parental confidence and competence. Assalamu alaikum, Maryam. Finally, we have Dr. Freya Khan, who is a general practitioner by profession. She is also a vice president for the Ladies Auxiliary here in the UK, as well as being in charge of the Ladies Publication Department. We'll come back to our expert panel and our studio audience in a moment. But first, we wanted to find out what people had to say about this topic. Take a look at the word on the street. Motherhood. Considered a blessing by many, yet arguably the toughest job in the world. With a third of the world's population wanting to be mothers at some point in their life, surely it must be both rewarding and fulfilling. So what is it about motherhood that attracts the modern women? And how can we as women prepare for this important role? We've come to the streets of London to find out what you think. Do you think it's difficult being a mother? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, very hard work. I don't think it's easy, but I think you adapt to it once you become one. So is it difficult being a mother? Not really. I don't think it's not for me, but I'm very lucky. I've got a very good baby and I've got my mum around the corner to help me. So from that point of view, yeah, it's really, it's really it's lovely. I think it's a full-time role. It's a big responsibility. But I think if you're ready for it and prepared, I think... You'll be, you'll be fine, but I do think you've got to accept that it's a very, very big responsibility. I think um, learning to have another responsibility in your life that's not yourself, um, putting someone else before yourself, um, and also costs involved in everything that comes with being a mother, really, which is quite hard work. I think patience is probably the, the biggest skill I think that you need, and I think we all struggle a little bit with that, but I think patience, probably. Patience and when they are a little bit older, the communication, that's also very really important once they reach teenager. Statistics show that the average family in the West spend almost a quarter of a million dollars raising a child to the age of 18. With more women working and increasing financial pressures, how are they balancing the act of working and having a family? With more women opting to have children later in life, what is the right time to start a family? Do you think that there are problems juggling motherhood with work? It can be. I mean, I think depending on where you work, it can be very hard. Um, if you work for a good company, they, you know, if there's a lot of mothers, they can work around it and things. But I do think some, a lot of parents do struggle. I think juggling the two can be a very big challenge. And I think for some mothers, they'll juggle it and some won't and some prefer to be at home all the time and they don't want to leave their children which makes it very hard if you've got, got to go to work. Um, yeah I think it is probably harder for women because men just have to do with um, making the money whereas women have to do with most women who are who are independent and single they have to do with work and a baby as well I think it is is much harder on them. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said paradise lies at the feet of your mother so how does the Muslim woman today rise to that challenge? Let's start the discussion with our panel. Maryam, why be a mother? Uh, well, as you said, Tahmina, it's one of the most popular jobs in the world. And it falls from being a natural instinct when we're in a stable relationship in a marriage and we're enjoying that, that relationship, the next step is to have a child. And it's something which comes naturally to us, an instinct. Yep. Nasser, would you like to add anything to that? Um, I would agree with Mariam. Being in, in the teaching profession, seeing young girls at school, whether in the reception or whether they're in year one, as they grow older, their instinct, they're more niche, they're more um, caring towards other people, they love playing with dolls, etc. And as an audience here, I'm sure they remember childhood memories of instinctively going towards playing houses, playing with dolls. 
for you, uh, what is the Islamic view on motherhood? What does Islam say about being a mother? Islam puts a lot of emphasis um, and gives a lot of importance to a mother. And the saying of Holy Prophet وسلم, tells us that um, it says that paradise lies under the feet of your mother. Um, it's basically, um, it explains that it is a mother's responsibility primarily to look after her children, to give them a home environment which could resemble paradise in this world. But in turn, when she raises pious and good citizens and they look after her as well, when she's older, it gives them, it promises them a reward of paradise in the other life. Um, Amtar Razak, is that view, is that Islamic view of motherhood compatible with um, the realities of Western life? Um, absolutely, absolutely. We all, coming from West or from Ahmadiyya Muslim background, wish to produce children who are good people. And when we are gone, they carry on with the good work that has been done. And this is the philosophy most mothers share. And Islam goes one step further and says, the, introduces the concept of sadqa jahriya, is that once you have taught your children good things, they carry on doing it once you have gone, then the reward of motherhood continues even after you have gone to the next world. Yeah. Well, what about the audience? Um, how do you view the role of motherhood? Um, what, is that view, do you think, compatible with the realities of, of Western life? I think the role of motherhood is quite challenging and uh, as well as the panel said rewarding and it's quite a big and huge responsibility on the mothers to bring up their children in a good and a nice way and in the modern day when young ladies um, start you know, doing a job and they study at the same time I think it will be more challenging for them to raise up their children. That's a really good point. Um, Mariam, do you think that the role of motherhood is challenging? Oh, incredibly challenging. Uh, we don't always think about that when we enter into it and we learn as we go, as we go along. Hindsight is a great thing. <laughs> and when we look back, we will always think maybe we could have done this a different way, but we must take each challenge as it comes and use the resources around us to face that in the best possible way we can. Yeah, Freya, as a working mother um, and taking what our audience just said, um, do you find that challenging to be working and having uh, children? It's extremely challenging. I would completely agree with that because you have to find that balance. Um, as a mother, your primary responsibility is upbringing of your children. But as a career woman, I wouldn't say there is a conflict. All you have to do is work hard and find that balance. In order to find that balance and, and meet those challenges, uh, Nasser, do you think that you need to be taught how to be a mother? Um, I think there's certain aspects of motherhood that you do need to learn about. Um, and they don't, it's nothing that, it, they don't come naturally. And that's why, I, I mean, this country especially, they have so many facilities that when a woman does become pregnant, they teach you specific things a mother has to know how to look after a child. But I think when a woman is pregnant, a natural motherly instinct kicks in and she naturally prepares herself. So I don't think it can be, I mean, you can be taught things and learn through experiences of your mother, of other people. I think experience is the best way to learn things when you hear about other people. Would you like to add to yes. that? Yes, skills that we need to call upon when uh, to practice motherhood I learned throughout life. For example, as siblings we are sharing, we learn to get to, we are taught patience, we are hopefully taught organisation, and we are taught the uh, punctuality and all these are extremely helpful skill to join the difficulties of career, to deal with the difficulties of career and motherhood. Yeah. D did you feel prepared for motherhood, um, Nasser? Did you feel that, that before you became a mother that you had these skills in place? Um, no, I mean, it is daunting. I think any new thing you venture into, you have, and an, it's the unknown for you, you have doubt in your own abilities, in your own skills. But I think within um, in my family, I have the support of, I had to support my mother, my sister, cousins, and I think a support unit is important and it gives you the confidence to try things and you will make mistakes. 
you know, but don't be scared. You, you know, you learn from your mistakes. What about the audience, um, those of you that are mothers? Did you feel challenged? Did you feel that you were prepared to be a mother? I think the word um, challenging comes up quite a lot when discussing motherhood. And um, as a new mother, my son is now nearly 10 months old. Um, I think that there are various aspects of motherhood that I never knew about before becoming a mother. Um, and no matter how much someone tries to prepare you for motherhood, you can never be prepared, but you can um, pray for yourself a lot. I think that's very important that when you are expecting your child that you pray for yourself a lot and then also socially you draw from the experiences of people around you and as um, the panelists have said that you have a good support network and um, you uh, embrace this new challenge. Okay, those of you that are not mothers, um, do you think that it would be helpful to learn more about the role before you become a mother? Yep, can we? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important to um, know, and uh, uh, as it's a very big challenge and huge responsibility, and uh, I think um, the best way to do is um, observe your own uh, mothers or grandmothers raising up their own children. That's a very good point. There's a comment in the back. Um, yes, I think it's very important to have as much preparation as possible. I mean, it's like an exam and, you know, if you're not prepared for it, you don't know what's going to come up and at the end of the day, you're still not going to know even if you are prepared. But it's important to have as much preparation for the physical aspects of being a mother, for the spiritual aspects of what you're going to teach them, how you're going to prepare yourself and how you're going to prepare yourself during your pregnancy. So in every way, so spiritually as well. So that I think it's very important where you can get that from Islamic teachings as well as from, you know, general sort of knowledge and, and scientific knowledge of how to prepare yourself. So it's, you know, we've advanced so much to have so much knowledge. It's important to acquire some of that knowledge. I want to come back to the panel now and talk about, um, is there a right age um, to think about becoming a mother? Amtul Razak, what do you think of that? There is a right age for every woman where she should get married, uh, would like to get married, but there's no generalization on that. Some people feel perfectly capable to, to deal with the challenges of motherhood in their late teens, early 20s, while others feel that they will have to invest their time and energy in other things before they can take on the challenge of motherhood. And both these options are right. Um, we need to take into consideration from a medical point of view, very early motherhood have got certain psychological challenges related to stress. Later motherhood carries the risk of infertility. So as long as one is aware of one's personality and the risk attached to either type of motherhood, then women, couples, can make a decision which is right for them. Uh, Freya, what do you think? Um, is there a right time? D does Islam say anything about, about this issue? Um, I mean, of course, Islam promotes uh, marriage. Um, this is something that Holy Prophet وسلم, himself chose for himself and to have children as well. And that's what he wanted for his followers as well. Um, and I mean, personally, I believe that um, I mean, of course, very early age, as Dr. Saba said, it's, it's, it has its own challenges, but the earlier um, you do it, then you do not have that later life problems. What about uh, people that, um, say, a young couple, especially living in kind of Western countries or really anywhere in the world, there may be financial fears, um, saying that they're not prepared financially for the burdens of, of children. Um, what would you say to that? I mean, as far as the Islamic point of view is concerned, um, Quran tells us two, two occasions that we should not consider um, birth control or stopping ourselves as a married couple from having children just for that reason, that financially we wouldn't be able to afford the child because Allah is the one who gives us everything. So I think that is one point that they shouldn't be concerned about. And what do you think about um, the career versus having um, children early on? A lot of women say, you know, we want to have a career first and, and put our stamp in the world before we have children. And 
we end up just raising them. What would you um, say to that? I think that's something you have to weigh up as a couple, what you want, wish to prioritise and um, how you feel you, you can manage your life and whether you are willing to give up something because as you say for a young mother it is harder for her to give up things which she feels maybe she will not be able to achieve later in her life. So it's a very personal decision I think. So what would you say to that? Well, definitely what I would say is that you have to be you'd, you have to want to be a mother when and you'll know when the time is right i mean if i give my own personal example i, I was a young mother i had my children and I'm, i was a mature student and just a couple of years ago i graduated so that's the way i chose my course of life with the support of my husband and my family and because when you become a mother you do need everyone's support and i think it's very important for young girls to understand there's not one set route you know there's so much variety in life so many like um, one of our audience was saying you know technologies there's so much technology so much to offer there's nothing wrong with taking that path first but it has to be in agreement yeah. with everyone. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Razak, would you then say motherhood doesn't, it doesn't interrupt life, does it? You, you have to make it all work. Oh, yes, with the grace of Allah, you, you just uh, are, find yourself in a position where everything eventually um, works for you. But it is, it is, as we all have recognized, is very challenging. Some, in my example, I think if I was, had the opportunity to become a mother earlier than I did, I perhaps would have been unhappy. After becoming a consultant surgeon, I felt that was an opportunity. I enjoyed my daughters more. I had more time on my hand. I had more control of my life. And so, as Nasra said, every woman has a different challenge. What about the audience? What do you think about the appropriate age or the career versus having children first? Um, let's come to the front here first. Well, ideally, um, I agree with the panelists, um, you should, the younger you are and having children at a young age, but um, the way the society is going and the way women are very much sort of career oriented and they do, do, they do want to develop their career. And I think we shouldn't penalize those, those women who do want to develop their career and wait and then have their children. I think that's perfectly okay as well. So there is another comment back here. Um, I was just going to say that I um, also started my career and then I felt ready that you know I'm established in my career and now I can have a child and I think that really helped me to organize my life and um, I knew the time I needed to give to my career and the time I needed to give to my child and my family so it has worked really well for me to establish my career and then have a child so it works different for every person I guess yeah how about back in the corner there I agree with the, the panellists um, at the front. I think one thing that as uh, Muslim um, wives and mothers we need to remember is that um, the mothers, um, when their children are getting older, when their their teenage years, before uh, you know, many years before they marry, they need to prepare um, girls and boys, but they need to prepare girls for all outcomes. So regardless of the career path or the education that they choose, they need to be prepared that from the moment they get married, they need to be mentally ready that they could have a, you know, a child within that first year, regardless of their, their studying um, or, or their uh, career, because um, we believe that God can um, do whatever he pleases it in that manner. And also we should also be prepared that um, if we've not taken educational or career route, that um, you know we shouldn't assume that we can automatically go into that mother role straight away because there may be some kind of you know physical um, difficulties at the, at the time, whether it's um, you know food, food diet or um, you know health etc and so we might then be blessed later on you know five or ten years down the line so I think it's very important that you know we're prepared for you know each eventuality and then can have an alternative lifestyle um, you know whatever that brings okay how about up here just one more comment I just wanted to add that from a purely physical point of view that if you have children when you're younger, you may be able to cope with it better from a physical point of view. Um, you'll have more energy to run after your child and you'll recover better from the actual physical stress of giving birth and also the inevitable fatigue and sleep deprivation that comes with having a young child. Yeah, that's a 
Good point. We started to talk about some of these physical considerations. Um, are there any health considerations, um, Thorazak, that we should take into consideration when we're contemplating motherhood? Absolutely. Uh, there is very good quality evidence that healthy mothers produce healthy babies. And many things I would urge ladies to consider is to be of normal weight. If you are within the normal weight with the body mass index between 20 and 25, which most of your GPs can tell you, then you're likely to have normal pregnancy. Folate is a um, supplement that women who are contemplating motherhood should take that reduces the risk of genetic abnormalities. There's also stress. Less stressed and relaxed you are, you're more likely to conceive more likely to have a healthier, happier baby. Great. Freya, is there anything that you want to add to that about how um, Islam uh, talks about any specific guidelines, health guidelines? I mean, Islam doesn't give any specific health guidance as far as I know for uh, women considering to be a mother. But as far as health guidance is concerned in Islam, uh, there is a lot available. Holy Quran tells us to eat healthily. Um, when it mentions on a couple of occasions about halal and tayyiban, the food that you eat should be lawful, but it should also be good, wholesome, um, it should be healthy for your body. So I think these are a few consider considerations that they can take as far as the health is concerned. But Islam also emphasizes on the spiritual preparation. There are specific prayers as well that you should recite. So all of these things should be considered. Uh, Nasser, did you do anything um, when you were contemplating motherhood in terms of the physical side to prepare? Yeah, I think as uh, Dr. Zak said, um, you have to be as best as you can to your best, uh, your best health. Take extra vitamins and you know exercise. All these things that we've taught to do daily but definitely I, w I agree with the panelists. And don't forget the practical side. So if you're a working mother, you need to start thinking about the childcare arrangement, your maternity leave, and yes. if during your job you get pregnant in early, very early stage of your career, then your chances for having maternity leave are much lower. So these are the other practical sides. Wherever you're working, you need to consider as well. I want to talk now uh, briefly about um, the, some of the risks that may come with this. Um, and uh, often in Islam, uh, we're told that cousin marriages are allowed. And, and some scientists say that there's a risk to children um, of cousin marriages. And I'm wondering what you think about that. The cousin marriage is, in a very, is a very important and perhaps at time misrepresented concept. There are many facets on which we should look at cousin marriage. Good quality social research shows that people, two parents who are related, when they produce children, children are likely to do well. They're likely to achieve higher socioeconomic status. The risk of domestic violence is very low. And also the risk of having deprivation is very low. Uh, or depression in women who are related to their husband is relatively low. On the other side of the coin, we also know that the risk of having congenital abnormalities or birth defect is about 3.5% across the board. And this risk is increased by 1% if parents are cousins. So just about a little bit it's increased. So these two have to be balanced. And another aspect perhaps we'd like you to consider is that if intermarriages go on for many, many, many generations, then there is a risk of diseases like deafness and thalassemia to come to surface. So taking all these factors into consideration, we need to make an informed decision about marriages within the family. Yeah, Priya, would you like to add anything to that? I mean, I just might like add that, uh, of course, Islam allows us to have cousin marriages, but we also have to find a balance, as it also tells us to find a middle ground in everything that we do. So in my opinion, if you see that there are serious genetic hereditary diseases that are being passed on from one generation to another, then we should consider and not force our children to marry in the family. Yeah, Nasser, would you like to add anything to that? What do you think about this issue? Um, well, I mean, recently um, I was hearing a quick, the answer to this from the fourth Khalifa of the MDA community answered this question. And as Dr. Zak said, it was, it's such a the marrying within cousins and without the there's such a small percentage difference that there could be problems that um Hazur Khalifa said that you can, it's not a clear proof that if you marry cousins 
something definitely will happen. So as uh, Dr. Freya is also saying, you have to see a family background because it's not necessary that you're cousins. Some child, children can still be born with defects. I may add that um, we do read in, in common press about uh, people in Bradford or Leicester or Birmingham where there are pockets of very um, significant genetic abnormalities in Asians which are thought to be because of family reasons. There is again that science has been challenged significantly because those women are generally deprived, a lot of them don't have language skills so they can't use their nat perinatal help. So that need to be looked into? Uh, not just this issue, but in general, where there is a risk. Um, do you think that uh, a woman should be tested for these risks um, during pregnancy, Freya? I mean, she can be tested, um, as, I mean, it's in my opinion. Of course, these are medical tests. They're not offered to everyone. These are specific tests that would be offered if your doctor considers you to be at a certain risk, whether it is your age or whether there is a family history. So a woman should consider, with the help of her doctor and her family, she makes a decision, she can go ahead. Right, is there was another comment back here. I just wanted to say, although the early years obviously are very, very difficult and very challenging, as we've discussed, they are also so rewarding. And once your kids go to school, you lose out on all that time that you have with them. So really try and make the most of it, the time you have with them. There's one back there first. About statistics, we have to remember that these are statistics of p probability, um, which don't always match up with factual statistics of what's out there. So there should be a distinction there. That's a good point. The one last point here. I just wanted to point out the fact that actually in the Holy Quran there is no prevention to marrying your cousin. Um, there are certain relationships where um, it is haram to um, marry a certain someone, but um, in, on the whole, it is not um, frowned upon. So I'm actually a product of a cousin uh, marriage and um, Alhamdulillah, um, everything has turned out okay. Um, and um, I think it's a uh, personal, uh, personal opinion and um, personal preference uh, to how you choose your uh, spouse. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we're going to leave the discussion here for now. Join us after the break when we discuss some of the challenges and the rewards of motherhood. We'll be right back. An interlingual channel promoting interfaith dialogue worldwide, live and interactive on satellite television and the internet. This is MTA International. Welcome back to Real Talk. Today we've been discussing the importance of motherhood and some of the challenges that this quest brings. I want to come back to the panel now and talk about this, those women that want to be mothers, um, but perhaps for some health reasons they're not able to become mothers. Um, Amthora, Zak, what do you think about? 3% of couples all over the world are unable to have children. We are very fortunate in this day and age with our less grace. There are many, many treatments available, like in vitro fertilization, and a uh, way in which even women can and chances to enhance uh, chances to conceive naturally are also enhanced islam gives very clear guidelines regarding these um, infertility treatment ahmadi muslims are allowed to have some of those but other treatments in which genetic material is used from somebody other than husband and wife uh, we are not allowed to have those treatment to preserve the biological sanctity of life Let's suppose that even with these treatments, um, that a couple is still not able to have a child. Freya, what then? Um, is there, uh, can they pursue adoption, for example? Of course they can, because as far as um, we know, that Islam puts a great emphasis on the society to look after its orphans. And the Holy Prophet, um, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, once said that whoever looks after an orphan and raises him or her well, he would be in the paradise very close to me and he actually raised his fingers and he showed this close. 
So I think with that beautiful teaching of Islam, if a couple cannot have a child of their own, they can look into raising an orphan perhaps, and I think that would be a great idea. Okay, there was a comment in the audience on that in the back. I just wanted to say that um, when a couple um, first get married, um, their natural course of progression is to have children, and they may do they may face um, certain challenges. Uh, it may be from the mother or from the father, and the main thing is not to get disheartened and um, consider do lots of different options. Um, speak to your GP and other consultants, and then even if um, all avenues have been um, looked into and you still cannot have children then like um, um, the panel member said that you can go into adopt and the main thing is that both parents should be um, willing and consider all options before they do that as well because it's it's quite um, hard on the child as well if only one parent is more geared towards adoption and not the other and also the wider family unit should be there to help as well. Yeah. That's a good point, we have another point on that side. Uh, yes, I think it's very important to um, also mention that in Islam, um, it doesn't specifically say that only ch only um, couples who um, cannot have children of their own, that uh, adoption is promoted. I think that uh, for any person who has enough love in their heart and uh, enough and enough space uh, to, to raise another child, if they have children or not, that if it's in their heart to pr provide um, this nurturing environment, then they should not be dissuaded from it. We have the example of Hazrat Ammajan, who was the revered wife of Hazrat Masih Maud She had children of her own, but she regularly adopted orphans and other children and looked after them and raised them and married them. So we have very good example, practical example of that in our day and age. Nasra, uh, two couples um, that aren't able to have their own children, um, especially to a woman who isn't able to become a mother herself, um, what would you say to her? Because Islam does say that a woman's primary role is to be a mother. Um, again, it is difficult. I think, first of all, everyone has to acknowledge the pain that person must be going through if that, per if that lady wants to become a mother and cannot. And I think to sympathise is important as well. But um, as a Muslim, you know, we always, when we are in trouble, we always fall back to pray to Allah. And that is such a comfort. And with all the options these days, you can foster, you can adopt, you have so many different options. Um, and within our Amdia um, community, we have so many schemes to help the orphans as well. So, I mean, I think definitely that woman needs support from her family and her friends and community. But um, it's prayer. Uh, Amtar Razak, the, uh, another kind of cultural stigma is um, the, uh, having a male child. Um, uh, women seem to be under pressure to, to bear that male child. And what would you say medically to that? Well, we know that the, the gender is determined by the chromosomes we have. So if we have XX chromosome that makes us all women and if we have XY chromosome that generates a male child and when a baby is is being made they take one chromosome from father and one from mother so if a child takes an X from mother and X from father they become a girl whereas if they take X from mother and Y from father then a male child is born so though Alamia determines the gender of the child, but the process that takes place is, comes through the husband, not through women. So I don't think women should feel under any pressure regarding this issue. Mariam, what do you have to say to this about this issue of, of having a male child over a girl child? I think that with time, um, our view on this is really changing as the world is changing. The emphasis is not so much on a boy. I think in, 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 a, in a different time, there was so much expectation from a boy. He was going to help you in your business. He was going to carry on your, your name, your family name. Whereas um, in the world we live in today, we don't have those same expectations. And actually, I think most mothers have the desire for a girl just as much as for a boy. 
me personally, I have three boys and um, they are very precious to me. But yes, not having a girl, it, I, I feel that and I would have liked, I would have liked to have both because I think that's, that's, it brings a balance to your life. What about uh, somebody that does have daughters? Uh, what, is, what is that blessing like? Oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> As they grow up, they become your friends and I can, no pleasure can match the shopping trip that you do with your daughter. <laughs> yes, about definitely. You? I've got three girls and each of them have bring something new to me. You know, they, they bring me back. Uh, you know, they have their qualities, they help me, they've helped me develop, you know, as I've grown older and having daughters is a blessing. Uh, Fri, what does Islam say about the blessings of, of having girl children? Um, Islam has given all the rights to a girl child and a woman. I mean, before Islam's uh, advent in the Arabia, the dark times, they used to treat their girls really, really badly. I mean. They used to kill them after they were born. They used to, there was no right that they had an inheritance. They didn't have any love either. So Holy Prophet actually gave that importance to that girl, child and to women um, on the whole. He himself had daughters and he loved them very dearly. So he has set an example for all the Muslim followers to love their daughters as well. Does you in one of his recent sermons, if I could quickly add, um, reminded us about the hadith of Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that girls stand between the hell and the father so we should really joy, enjoy the presence uh, the blessings of our daughters I think we, as we, uh, um, life is developed and it's important girls are not a burden anymore a lot of the times girls are the ones who are supporting their families and that thought that girls were just a burden, you have to spend on them, spend on their marriage, that is, I think, like a myth now. You know, I, it's not, it's, I don't think, I, I think especially the audience, the young audience in front of me, I don't think you can relate to that, that you're a burden, because you're educated, young, smart women, and you, you're holding your own. Yeah. I want to move on now and talk about once you have had your, ch your children and that period of early motherhood and the challenges and, and the rewards that comes with that. Mariam, what is that, that early period like? Um, it can be quite a shock if I'm honest yeah. with you. Yeah. The, your life will change in a very dramatic way. There's this young baby who is completely dependent on you for everything um, and it can, it can feel like quite a pressure at the time because you know even having a shower can seem quite difficult fitting that in into your daily routine um, but then at the same time as you watch that child grow and develop and you think that you are supplying its every need it feels incredibly rewarding and it's a great pleasure and to be able to see your parents faces and those around you actually I think that everybody's face when a, a, a mother is pushing a pushchair down the road everyone will look at the baby and have a smile on their face or have a comment um, because it's a it's a natural thing for us very enjoyable I just yeah. add that not when um, a woman has a child in I don't know in, in Muslim culture and Asian culture um, for the first 40 days that woman's asked to rest and at first I used to think it's just a cultural thing that the mum comes she look after us because I see my non-Muslim friends taking their kids to school a day after they've had the baby etc that but in recent research even doctors now ask women for the first 40 days to look after themselves to look after their bodies so they get back that strength that they've used during pregnancy and birth. So I think it's interesting how society now is coming round to old wives tales as they would be called I would say. Are they just old wives tales or, or is there something in Islam that, that talks about that early period for you? I mean I'm not aware of any Islamic um, teachings regarding that. Perhaps um, Dr. Amtulzak would like to say something but culturally we have always put a great emphasis and I think it is quite important because you need to rest and for first 40 days medically lots of things are happening to you as well um, the, uh, things are going back to what they used to be your body is adjusting back to what it was before you had a child as well so it is quite important to look after yourself French are leading the way in research in rehabilitation of mothers and they have come to exactly the same conclusion first 40 days should be used can should be used to bar, make a bond with your child it doesn't mean that you have to be confined to home with your baby 
but it is also to be recognized that babies are incredibly vulnerable to any viral infection at that time. So spend more time at home, more time relaxing with the baby. And in our culture, with the concept of some elder staying with you for first 40 days, I had my elder sister look after me for 40 days, and that was absolutely fantastic. Um, I'd just like to say to you that once you're a mother, logic goes out the window. And my daughter, she's a math student. Everything makes sense. Everything's balanced for her. And since she's had two children, it's gone out the window. So be prepared for surprises. How about some reaction from the audience about this early stage? Yeah. Can I just add to what you were saying that about relaxation at home and mothers resting? And I think it's not just relaxation at home. I think mothers should also go out, leave maybe the baby at home, someone who can care for the baby, and just have that time out going out with their husband to have some coffee, have something to eat, or shopping, or whatever they enjoy doing. How about back in the corner? Um, also, I think that um, those women who don't have the support network of their, maybe their mothers or s any sisters or, or anyone immediate that they can turn to, say for example if they're living in a different country then it's, or even at home, it's really important for the husband to um, be there and support the, um, the, the wife, um, the mother and also chip in and do his share as well, ch nappy changing etc. Yeah, that's a great point. I want to come back to the audience and uh, to the panel and uh, talk about postnatal depression, especially in that early period. Um, Amtur Tuzak, what is postnatal depression? Um, it is a well-known scientific fact that hormones play an important role in the moods, m moods of women. And during pregnancy, hormone levels are very, very high. After the birth of baby, there is a sudden drop in the level of these hormones, and certain women react in different ways. Sometimes they can be very low moods as a result of this drop in hormones, and that's called postnatal depression. Whereas the other extreme is that women become too hyperexcitable, and that's called postnatal psychosis. Both these are well recognized, short lived conditions that can be treated very well with support of family, and particularly the point made about husbands. Hus women are extremely vulnerable at that time. And we all know that the last advice of the Holy Prophet ﷺ to us was that look after your women, they are vulnerable. And th this is the most vulnerable part of their life. They physically look different from what they would like to look. They don't feel in control of their environment. Babies po pose challenge that they may not be prepared for. And husband can play a pivotal role in supporting the ladies and getting them out of this difficult situation. Mariam, where do women go if they're experiencing um, any of these symptoms or any of these problems in early, uh, early motherhood? Well, depending on where you live, there are always facilities for young mothers around. Um, and the important thing is, I think, not to sit at home and feel you're the only person with this problem. Go out and get involved in groups where you have coffee mornings, you have play groups, you have mother groups. And when you sit there and you talk to other mothers, you'll realize that they're all going through similar things and they will be able to offer you practical advice and help because they will be going through the same thing. Um, I think a starting point is your GP if you, are, if you are in a place where you are not familiar with such services and they can point you in the right direction. Depression can come as a shock to you because you've had your baby, all of a sudden you're a mum now. You don't think about yourself as much anymore. And, you, and I think a lot of us think it's not going to happen to us. And so, um, as one of the audience members said, it's, it's important you give yourself you time and analyse yourself. And if you are feeling in a mood that you're not normally, there's nothing wrong with it, but try and have do something about it. But I think after being a mother, we forget about ourselves. Yeah, Fia, what, as, a, as a GP, what, what would you say to a woman that may be experiencing difficulties in that early period? I think first of all, you would like to recognize what you're feeling and uh, go and seek help and see your GP. There is a clear distinction between baby blues, which most of the women feel, 50 to 70 percent of women feel, but you, where you're just irritable, crying because of the routine being disturbed, etc., and lack of sleep. But that, that normally settles within a couple of weeks. The postnatal depression is something that is ongoing and can go up to a year after birth. The most important thing that you have to watch out for, apart from regular symptoms as irritability, crying, feeling low, 
is that if you're feeling that you can't bond well with your child, that is quite an important symptom to look out for because that has effect on your child as well. So go and see your GP and discuss. There are loads of treatments and options available. Okay. I want to come to the audience now. Did you feel overwhelmed in that, that point, uh, those of you that are mothers? Uh, back in that corner. Um, a slight on an, an aside, um, away from um, baby blues and, and depression, but uh, more about um, accessing your support network. Um, I just wanted to um, add that I think in this day and age, um, there's a lot of um, young mothers who have a very good support network, um, but maybe the opposite of um, uh, postnatal depression is happening, uh, even though they might have similar symptoms, in that they're so overwhelmed by the amount of support network that are in their living space that that they find it very hard to, that they want to maintain control. So the opposite happens as, a, as opposed to not feeling that bond with their child. They're obsessing that they want to keep that bond with their, their child and be with them at all times um, and feeling like um, maybe the child uh, won't think that that is their mother if someone else is holding them, you know, uh, during that 40 day period, for example. So I think it's very important for new mothers to realize that any support that they do get, that it is actually for their own benefit and they need to learn to let go, learn to, you know, take advantage of that longer bath that they wouldn't have had a chance to do if someone wasn't there. Let that person into their kitchen and cook for them and, and tidy up. And the more you let go and more you're relaxed, uh, the more likely the, the baby is to actually sleep better as well because they will pick up on your lack of anxiety then if you're, you are able to relax. Yes, that's a point. Um, when you have a child, you will be bombarded with advice. You'll be probably told 10 different ways to change a nappy, 10 different ways how to put your baby to sleep. But uh, my advice is take it with a pinch of salt, you listen to it and you do what suits you. I've had four children. For each child, I've been told to put them to sleep a different way. Alhamdulillah, they're all well, they're healthy. But as uh, scientific uh, statistics come out, we are being told it's bet this, something's better for the baby, something's better this time next year, etc., etc. So you will be bombarded with advice. My advice to you is just listen calmly and do what suits you. Yes, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Our expectation of how we're going to feel once we have the baby can often be not exactly how we feel when it, ha when it happens and that can lead to these feelings of maybe feeling a bit blue. So I think it's a good idea to not pin everything on this baby. It is part of your life, and it was, but it's not your complete life. And, and, if, and if you feel the expectation is too high and then it doesn't quite fulfill or doesn't quite feel the way you expected it to feel, you could perhaps start feeling more towards the baby blues. Yeah, that's a really good point. And when we're talking about the support system, um, a, a key ingredient there is the father. Um, Freya, what, what is the role of fatherhood? What is the role of a father in that early period of, of motherhood? I think fathers should play um, an important role, a huge role, especially in this society when most of us are not living in extended families. We haven't got um, our close family living close by to us anyways. Some of us, some of them have to travel um, even if they are living in the same city. And in this day and age, fathers, um, I, I think, fathers do take part a lot in a child's upbringing um, and they should help out mother as much as they can. Perhaps she can take a longer nap and um, they can um, do the duties and perhaps feed the child or look after the crying baby. Yeah. Mariam, what, what would you say then is the, is the role of a father in, in the upbringing of a child? Yeah, he's your partner in bringing up that child. So he has all the responsibilities you have, it's shared. Um, and I think it's very important that you've talked about this before the baby arrives and you are working off the same sheet, the same rules. Um, I think it's a good idea to discuss your own childhoods because often the way your parents raised you you will instinctively use those same techniques with your children. So talk about your own childhood, how you were brought up, and then choose the things that you like and choose, and, and choose the rules and the, the, the methods that you would want to then use on your child and make sure you are always um, up front together. Do not contradict each other, do not criticize each other um, and, and work as a team. Science also shows the role of father is very well established because children who have a strong male bond to do very well in schools, they are high achievers even if they come from deprived backgrounds and girls in particular are unlikely to go 
the wrong path if they have a strong role model at home. Okay, that's a good point. We had some comments from the audience. One back here. Um, picking up on your earlier point of um, orphans, I was just thinking that um, I, my um, second father, he's brought up three children and he showed so much love and affection. So I think that um, it doesn't, it's not necessary that a biological father will actually um, shower that, that, that amount of affection and love on a child. And I've seen that in my own experience. So, and I see that my, my son now turns to his, his grandfather for that um, fatherly kind of love and fatherly affection, yeah. Um, there was a comment back here as well. To add to uh, Marian's point of role of father, that um, before my baby was born, my husband and I sat down and we discussed things that we would do and we wouldn't do, and uh, things that you know we wouldn't contradict each other, and uh, we try our best not to do that even now in front of our baby. So I think it's really important um, to have that discussion and um, the role I see that my husband plays with his daughter is amazing and he will, they go out on walks and she's only one and a half years old but she has a special um, bond with her dad now. Even sometimes I feel it's even stronger than my bond with her that she has a really strong bond. And this thing um, that society, um, understands the role of fathers. More and more fathers are given paternity leave to take time. So they, again, I probably through research, they have found out the importance that a father has, one, in supporting the new mother and the bond that a child has with his, the father. We're going to have to start wrapping it up here. But um, Mariam, I want, to, I want to talk about now, what, what have you enjoyed about motherhood? What, what have you found to be um, the good parts of motherhood? Uh, well, I'm through the really young phase. My youngest is four. Uh, and what I enjoy is when I see their own personality come through. Each of them are so different, whereas they've been brought up in the same house and with the same general guidelines and rules. Um, and when I see them go out and make decisions and be themselves and take on responsibility and use the things that we've taught them and help them and encourage them to do and they go and they do them by themselves it's very rewarding it's very i think that's the best thing yeah, what have you found to be rewarding about motherhood i think for me personally it's the day-to-day -day little things the love and affection that i get from my girls the hugs the laughter that we enjoy together the little things the little the faces that that they make and all of these things throughout the day make you smile, make you laugh, and that just makes you feel more happier and just brings that joy into your life. Yeah. Um, Razak, what are some of the challenges that you, that you have faced or that you think mothers in general face? <laughs> challenges, uh, being a woman surgeon in training, um, having very difficult pregnancy and a very beautiful baby that you never wanted to leave was, was I had everything. Um, I think the immense gratitude I have with all these challenges was that I learned to pray. I thought I knew how to pray, but after my baby, I actually learned to pray. I realized the importance of prayers, importance of listening to Hazur's sermons every Friday, and importance of having that strong bond with my God, because I remember I've, I've heard, heard Hazur Ramahullah say that mothers who have strong bond with the God, their children don't go astray. So that's the biggest blessing for me. I want to go to the audience one last time just for some uh, last reactions about the topic at hand. Um, here in the middle. I think being a mother is such a huge responsibility. It's a very important role. I don't think we can ever be prepared for it as much as we can. Um, but one thing that we must remember is through uh, physical development, uh, we must understand that it's, it's a means of spiritually developing oneself as well. And if we play our roles right, then um, I think both couples, both the husband and the wife, uh, can attain nearness to God in that way. Yeah, that's a brilliant point. Uh, we had another comment in the back. Yeah. I just wanted to say, although the early years obviously are very, very difficult and very challenging, as we've discussed, they are also so rewarding. And once your kids go to school, you lose out on all that time that you have with them. So really try and make the most of it, the time you have with them. Uh, there's a comment up here. Oh, 
I would just like to add one last point, um, going back even further from early motherhood to when you're actually expecting the child. Um, I was told to read the Holy Quran a lot. Um, and in actual fact, there's a lot of scientific evidence as well to show that the baby in the womb listens and hears what the mother is saying especially and for me um, that was a very calming and serene time when I used to recite the Holy Quran and feel that my baby was listening to me because even now when he is now 10 months old and I recite the Quran in front of him he will stop whatever he is doing and he will uh, turn to me and just listen and for me as a Muslim, I think that that is a very important point in my early motherhood stage. Is there any other last point over here? Uh, yes, I just wanted to go back even further to the before uh, pregnancy stage that I think that is very important that as Muslim women, um, regardless of um, our, our outcome as um, wives and hopefully uh, mothers, whether that's um, naturally or through adoption, that um, we pay um, a lot of attention towards our education um, because um, regardless of, uh, as the point I mentioned earlier, that uh, whether we have children straight away or after five or ten years or never at all, that we're supposed to be showing an example to the, the wider society and play an active role in that. And so um, we should further our education to the best means so that whether we're uh, volunteering for charity work or going into a profession, that um, as a, we can show our nephews, our nieces or our neighbours' children um, an example of Islam that way. Yeah, there was a, another point uh, right in front of you. Um, it was just a comment about spirituality and getting um, being prepared that um, um, my husband used to recite um, the first and the last three chapters of the Holy Quran every single day while I was expecting and um, it used to calm the baby and when she was born and every time she cried and even now when he does that it calms her she absolutely gets quiet so I think it's really important um, the Holy Quran um, I used to put it on um, on my laptop and while I was working in the house I had it on all the time just that it affected me as well and I'm sure that I hope it that it affected my baby as well. I want to come back to the panel for one last uh, comment from each of you, your last impression on what we've discussed today and really particularly how faith should inform our motherhood and um, what you would say to non-mothers and, and how faith should play a role in their lives. Um, well, just as the audience has been saying that, you know, reading the Quran, having strong faith, having belief is very important to know that Allah provides everything, Allah, then, and you're not alone, Allah is with you. And motherhood is something to look forward to and embrace it with joy. Motherhood has got so many attributes, you don't have to be a biological mother mm -hmm. to show that to the whole of the world. Maryam. I would say that your most powerful tool as a mother is the role model that you play. So um, in early motherhood, just reflect on the, the role that you are portraying to your children and do the best that you can and follow the guidelines that Islam has put there for you. And Freya. I mean, I think I agree, of course, with the, all, all what the panel has said. But just um, wanted to say to girls that enjoy that time with your children as well. Because in no time they will grow up and then you would miss that time when they were younger. So enjoy every minute of being a mother. That's all the time that we have here today. I want to thank our panelists and our studio audience for joining us to discuss this topic of motherhood. There's so much more to discuss and inshallah we'll cover it in future programs. I want to thank the viewers at home for joining us as well. Remember you can join in the discussion by emailing us. Our web address is mta.tv slash realtalk. You can also follow us on Twitter. Thank you again for joining us. Jazakumullah. Assalamu alaikum.